Dragon Ball Fighters is a game that has taken us from the pinnacle of excitement 2018 to the depths of controversy. Ah, that's oh. it, yeah. Good job. Point of With the most recent version of the game and rollback update for DBFC having a less than positive reception, I thought now would be a great opportunity to go back and look at the roller coaster journey it's taken the community to get here and how the game has got to where it is today for better or worse. Stick around as we unravel the mystery and uncover the impact this has had on the game's dedicated scene, past and present. Get ready because we have quite a lot to cover here, so let's get into it. Dragon Ball Fighters released in January of 2018 to critical acclaim, captivating players with its flashy, fast-paced yet deep gameplay and faithful adaptation of the beloved franchise. Published by Bandai Namco and developed by Arc System Works, who are most known for their anime titles with amazing visuals, as well as plenty of beloved titles in the fighting game community, including Blaze Blue, Guilty Gear, and Persona 4 Arena. Needless to say, the game looks and plays beautifully, and you can tell from the ground up that this is a true passion project from Arxis. The movesets, animations, little references and respect they give to the source material is second to none, and there is always something cool to notice for fans of the series and newcomers alike. All of these factors combined makes DBFC for many, myself included, the best Dragon Ball game of all time. After all, this is a series about warriors overcoming their limits and defeating all challenges by becoming the strongest fighter. The game's launch saw great success from critics, receiving rave reviews and high scores across the board. Hardcore fighting game players also welcomed the game with open arms, with the game clearly receiving inspiration from Marvel vs. Capcom 3, another beloved fighting game. Put it this way, it's hard to find folks in the FGC who are not Dragon Ball fans as it is, so it's a match made in heaven. It even united players from all kinds of fighting game titles and created moments and matchups we would never see anywhere else, such as the incredible undefeated streak of Goichi, this guy is currently undefeated in tournament, and his legendary feud with Sonic Fox. Goichi is your final round champion. What a tremendous grand finals. The guarantee it's settled now. Goichi is without question the best in the world. Nowhere else could you see a Mortal Kombat icon face off with an anime legend on an even playing field, and the fighting game community lapped it up. Breaker 2018 Dragon Ball Fighters Champion. My dude got so hyped he forgot to put the head back on. Make some noise, ladies and gentlemen. Sonic Fox takes it over Goichi. At the helm, fighter's producer Tomoko Hiroki was extremely visible on the brand and acted as the face for the game. She was seen by fans as almost a link between the community and Bandai and would show up on special occasions to help promote the game. All eyes were on DBFC, as in June of that year, Beyond the Summit, who are usually known for their big Smash Brothers tournaments, ran the Summit of Power, giving us an exciting preview of some of the players to look out for in the World Tour, which kicked off as CEO later that month. Players could qualify for the finals of the official circuit by winning tournaments held offline all over the world, with prize money up for grabs and even Dragon Balls in a nice extra touch from Bandai. Things seem to be amazing for the scene, with DBFC proving to be an incredible game for both players and spectators alike. <laughs> However, while things were great for those playing offline, beneath the game's surface lay a glaring flaw, the online experience. For many players, venturing into the online realm felt like navigating through a minefield of lag spikes and inconsistent connections. The culprit? Delay-based netcode. But what is this and what does it mean? Delay-based netcode introduces input delay to synchronize actions between players and is fairly common for most fighting games since the dawn of online multiplayer since it's fairly cost-effective and easy to implement. The input delay between players can lead to a sluggish and unresponsive gameplay experience, especially in fast-paced titles like fighting games. Additionally, delay-based netcode may struggle to provide consistent performance across different network conditions, resulting in uneven gameplay experiences for players with varying levels of latency. So with all of that in mind, the DBFC World Tour introduced online tournaments as part of the season with Dragon Radar events. Dragon Radar events were held offline at select majors and online on a regional basis worldwide, with first place receiving free air travel and hotel for any of the seven upcoming Saga World Tour tournaments to attend, or even the last chance qualifier tournament at the finals of that season. And he will earn himself a trip to a Saga event. I actually think that's a pretty fair way to run an online portion of a world tour, with Bandai giving a player who may excel in an online environment a way to prove their worth offline, especially from regions that may have difficulty traveling. 
I also feel like this doesn't weigh too much on the competitive integrity of the tour, since you cannot qualify directly to the finals by winning an online radar event this way. It seems Bandai took the game's online limitations into consideration and kept the world tour exactly as it should be. You know, a tour with stops all over the world? The tournaments were exciting and the scene was living and breathing this game, trying to absorb as much information as possible. Bandai were also on top of the regular updates for the game, fixing bugs and adding 8 new DLC characters throughout the year with the Fighters Pass. Aside from a couple of characters though, most of them were pretty terrible at the time of release. EVO 2018 was monumental for the community, with 2,576 players descending upon Vegas to play DBFC, making it the most popular game in signups for that year. Not only would we get another chapter in the Sonic Fox vs Goichi saga in Grand Finals, with Sonic taking the win, the iconic Cell Yell was born. Uh -oh. <laughs> Bro, just look at this, man. This is what it's all about. As we headed into the World Tour, four of the seven Dragon Balls were won by Kazunoko, a player known for his exceptional skill in a number of previous fighting games. Winning four Saga events in a single World Tour season was a remarkable feat. His success may have surprised fans who were accustomed to seeing more diversity in tournament winners and undoubtedly led to discussions about game balance. Yeah, Kazunoko usually picks whatever the cheapest strategy is in any game he plays. Rather than giving the qualifying spots to the runners-up of the Saga events, however, Bandai decided to run four, yes, you heard me, four last chance qualifiers on the same day at the finals. Welcome everybody to the final summoning. This was a pretty insane decision and that day was an absolute marathon for the players involved. Bear in mind season one had way less damage and every single game was much longer than they are these days, so yeah. Huge shout outs especially to Fenrich who came top 5 in all 4 LCQs, eventually winning the final one and making a run all the way to the grand finals in the main event, where he would eventually be defeated by the Dragon Ball hoarder himself, Kazunoko. This is amazing, look at this! The also during the World Tour Finals, someone somewhere at Bandai messed up royally and posted the Fighters Pass Season 2 reveal trailer early, showing Videl, Jiren, Broly and Gogeta Blue. It was quickly taken down, but because this is the internet, of course, it was reposted everywhere. Hiroki revealed it after the Grand Finals anyway, but undoubtedly someone was fired for this mistake. Much to the delight of the dedicated player base, a second year of the World Tour was also teased. This is the perfect way to close out the first season of a World Tour, new DLC on the way, and also another pro circuit. This is a great move from Bandai, and they really knew what they were doing back then. The Season 2 update would officially drop in March of 2019 and included a complete character balance overhaul and various bug fixes. We would also get a very special trailer and character release on May 9th or Goku Day. This would change the game forever, or at least for the rest of the year. In June of 2019, the next season of the World Tour was announced. This time we would see 16 players qualify for the finals instead of 8 and introduce a global leaderboard to keep avid players hungry to travel and attend as many events as possible for a shot at qualifying. I think a lot of people forgot about this, but Bandai actually removed the online tournaments from the DBFC World Tour for this season. This could mean that perhaps they became aware of the negative feedback and wanted to focus fully offline with various tournament stops in the form of Tenkaichi events and the bigger Red Bull Saga events happening all over the world. They did it! More new characters and trailers were being dropped regularly at big events and the DBFC hype was at an all-time high, despite the game being dominated by the terror that was GT Goku, one of the newest DLC characters that was seen as the undisputed best in the game. EVO this year was yet again an outstanding event for the game with the most fitting grand finals you could imagine. The rematch between Sonic Fox and Goichi. They met in the finals with Goichi overcoming his rival amidst an electric atmosphere. Keep it simple, there it is, Goichi, your Dragon Ball Fighters 2019 EVO Champion! There were several problems with this season on the competitive front, especially as time went on. The snapback and universal fuzzy meta were heavily abused by maybe around 10 to 15 characters, and any tall characters were pretty much written off completely due to getting opened up non-stop. So scary because pretty much any block of assist leads to a fuzzy, like anywhere on the screen. Which, looking back now, was terrible. I'm sorry, anybody looking back at this season and misses it, you are out of your mind. This was awful. The other issue came with balance. From March until the end of the season, we didn't see any game balance changes, so of course, GTA Mania was running wild. Brother. The second year of the game culminated with the World Tour Finals in Paris, France in early 2020 and couldn't have gone any better. 
insane attendance numbers, outstanding matches, including perhaps the greatest grand finals in DBFC history between teammates and rivals Goichi and Fenrich. Goichi came out the gate with a perfect, that's a perfect, and Fenrich answering back with a perfect of his own. This set was just insane and it doesn't get any better than this. The viewership for this event was also the highest for any Red Bull backed esports event up to that point. I am the strongest. We would also get some incredible reveals with Fighters Pass 3, showing two fan favorite characters, Kefla and Ultra Instinct Goku, and huge gameplay changes such as Assist Select and Limit Break, which would make your final character more powerful. The future was bright and DBFC was looking absolutely white hot, an unstoppable force in the FGC and proved it was here to stay as a staple of any big fighting game event. Fast breaking developments in the virus emergency in the US and around the world. The World Tour Finals finished on the 9th of February 2020. One month later, the world would be turned on its head as the virus outbreak would be declared a pandemic and a global emergency. Like almost everything else at the time, this caused all major fighting game tournaments and events such as EVO, Combo Breaker and CEO to get cancelled due to health and safety concerns. These events serve as key gathering points for the FGC, providing opportunities for competition, camaraderie and community building. It goes without saying this was a huge blow to the scene and of course, the DBFC community. With so many of the major events being cancelled, the player base was forced to adapt, leading to a surge in online events. I feel like the last tournament that I streamed, really this was the same match. While these tournaments provided a lifeline for the community, they also highlighted the shortcomings of delay-based netcode in a remote setting. He is really going for DRs, man. Fully aware of the environment. PS4 Online, do it. With so many online tournaments happening around this time, influential figures within the FGC, including players, tournament organizers, and content creators, started advocating for better netcode solutions, such as rollback netcode. It's absolutely embarrassing that a game in 2013 is what the standard of 2019 cannot reach. This is a term thrown around a lot, but what actually is rollback netcode? Rollback netcode is a networking solution used in online multiplayer games to synchronize the game state between players over the internet. Unlike delay-based netcode, which introduces a fixed delay between player inputs and game actions, rollback netcode focuses on prediction and correction mechanisms to minimize the impact of network latency and ensure smooth and responsive gameplay. Notable examples of games using this at the time were Skullgirls and Killer Instinct, which were praised for their online experiences. However, Japanese developers most likely didn't know how important online would be to fighting game enjoyers at the time. I mean, how can you blame them? They didn't know what was going to happen. Arc System Works' newest game at the time, Grand Blue Fantasy Versus, was released during this period unfortunately, and despite being a great game, was sadly doomed to fail in terms of offline competition as it never got a chance to be featured at big events for the first couple years of its lifespan. Yep, delay-based strikes again. Bandai would create the Dragon Ball Fighters show to keep avid players and fans happy with game news, patch note changes, and character previews. And as a main part of these shows, I have to say we did our best to make you guys proud during these hard times, and I hope you enjoyed these streams. With all in-person events around the world getting cancelled for health and safety concerns, officially backed world tours would also get cancelled for every game, and Dragon Ball Fighters was no exception. Instead, we would get the DBFC National Championship, a new incentive held exclusively online for the most active regions at the time. Spain, France, USA East, USA West, and Japan. This series would see the eight strongest players from each region play out in a round robin format over eight weeks to decide the winner, all online. Of course, five regions playing a ton of matches over a two month period on fighters less than favorable delay based netcode is going to see some issues, and we did so pretty quickly. Chris, drop that combo. During the first week of matches, Chris G would play against Reynold in the USA West League and had a pretty bad experience to say the least. <laughs> After what could be described as a less than serious set, Chris dropped out of the national championship, stating on Twitter, I've experienced stutter before, but not like last night. I don't play PC DBFC much, and I don't do lobbies, so this was new to me. Last night's set with Reynold was an interesting one, full of mashing and dropped combos. I've played Reynold many times, and it was never this bad. This was almost unplayable. Even during the first TOD, I said out loud, this can't be real, and prayed to God I didn't drop the combo. 
As the set went on, I cared less and less as more combos were dropped. After the third game, I legit thought about quitting. With that said, I refused to do six more weeks of this. Even if I win all of my matches, I refuse to play in a serious situation where I cannot give it my all and have the commentators make excuses for why I can't do ABC combos. With that said, I'm dropping out of the world tour. Thank you for the opportunity and good luck to everyone involved. I'll stick to casuals, lol. Situations like this would of course shine a floodlight on an issue that we all knew was apparent. Bandai had tried to provide an alternative for the DBFC competitive scene, which you have to commend them for, but inadvertently put the one huge shortcoming it had front and centre for everyone to see. This was frustrating for the community, as over time, the more online tournaments that took place, the more of an issue this was becoming. Everyone I play online is so laggy. I mean, it isn't like we had a choice, but it was an increasingly heated topic of discussion. Drama aside, the national championships concluded in December with the last remaining DLC characters for Season 3 revealed at the Japan Finals, which in a somewhat controversial move was played offline while all the other regions had to decide their champion online. Super Baby 2 and Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta were announced and we all absolutely lost it. No way! Looking back at this, it's crazy how hyped the game was despite us still not having any offline events. Arc System Works were also working on Guilty Gear Strive around this time, the latest release in their storied franchise. Despite the first closed beta for the game using delay-based netcode, the devs seemingly listened to the community's cries for an improved online experience, and confirmed the final release of the game would in fact use rollback netcode instead, which they were currently developing. Around this time, the devs faced mounting pressure to address the netcode controversy for existing releases, most notably DBFC. While acknowledging the community's concerns, they cited technical challenges in retrofitting rollback netcode into that specific game. During an interview in July of 2021, Takeshi Yamanaka and Akira Katano of Arc System Works spoke on the matter, stating, On a purely technical side, is it feasible? Yes, it is. However, it is extremely difficult to retrofit rollback. Because the game was not designed with rollback in mind, you can never know where the program is going to start behaving unpredictably. From these comments alone, you can see that improving the online experience of DBFC was never a case of simply recoding the online portion of the game. It's also possible that the limitations of DBFC's delay-based netcode persisted due to a number of factors. Technical or hardware constraints or even other priorities within the development team, such as Strive, which they could have shifted full focus and budget towards at that time. It would have also been down to the publisher to fund this, and maybe Bandai didn't think it was worth it. Despite the challenges the scene faced around this time, the FGC persevered, showing resilience in the face of adversity. Community-led initiatives and online gatherings kept the spirit of competition alive, showcasing both strength and unity. Oh! That was a bad decision. Taking place in early 2021 was Dragon Ball Games Battle Hour, which acted almost as an online convention for all things related to Dragon Ball Games and also featured some exhibition matches and showcases for fighters, the Dragon Ball card game, legends and more. It used this online lobby system where you could meet up with friends and other viewers to watch the content live in a virtual hub. Pretty cool idea honestly. We also got to showcase Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta at this event, and watching this back, it was really fun to see some of your reactions to this guy. At the time, it was thought that perhaps he could also be the final DLC character for the game, but, um, oh god, oh god, oh god. 2021 went on, and the pandemic showed no signs of slowing down. With offline events seemingly not coming back anytime soon, and the online national championship results being seen as almost illegitimate by a majority of the scene, and with no way for international competition to go head-to-head, -head, it was hard to say which player or region was currently the strongest. The French community had been grinding and leveled up massively during lockdown, so much that a lot of people, the EU scene mostly, thought that they may be the best right now. Especially with the decline in the Japanese player base who were the most dominant the last time offline events were held. Of course, with social media, tempers flare and egos clash, and before we knew it, a simple discussion of tier lists flared into an entire France versus US debate. Objection. Objection. With both sides claiming that they would win offline. Of course, playing this out online was impossible with delay-based netcode. But with some official backing from Bandai, a special offline event was able to take place in Paris, which would see five of the strongest US players go up against five of the strongest French players. We've seen all the talk online, we've seen all the talk on Twitter. Now it's time yeah. to back up them words, boy. Yeah. I wanna see. This would be called the DBFC World Championship Opening Event, 
which saw a 16 man exhibition tournament as well as a special 5v5 showcase go down, giving us the international offline DBFC fix we've been waiting for for so long. Where a certain individual. Uh, may we? May we? Mix, mix. Don't you buy the mask? Mix, mix, mix. Dead. This is four bars. He's going to kill. Mix. 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 I will never underestimate Hook's clutch potential. Yeah! Look at America, we're smiling, brother! Die! Oh! Hook! Game! Go! My man Die. literally went for DP into Spark! As the dust settled, France would emerge as the winners, and their training had clearly paid off. And as the name of the event suggested, this year's Pro Circuit would be titled the DBFC World Championship. This year would not only feature official online tournaments, but also include community events which you could apply for through Bandai's online portal. A mix of invited players who did well at the national championship, as well as players who placed high on the points leaderboards would earn a chance to compete at three separate regional finals in December 2021 to decide the champion of the USA, Europe and Japan. The highest placing players here would go on to the world championship finals, which would be held offline at a later date. In the FGC, we use the phrase World Tour or Pro Tour or something similar to describe an entire season of tournaments or events officially backed by the publisher. Note how Bandai did not use that phrase at all when describing these online-only events such as the National Championship or the World Championship. But yeah, an all-online season, even if it results in an offline finals, as far as I'm concerned, cannot be a tour. So, you know, kudos to Bandai for not false advertising that. Competition was fierce, and around this time in-game, it also felt like a big turning point for the meta of DBFC as a game previously about lockdown block strings with assists and high-low mix, was shifting more towards fast-paced neutral and heavy use of defensive assists instead. With no new announcements for DLC on the horizon or an official Season 4 to drive increased interest, it was down to the community to band together and hold it down once again for DBFC. This is actually where we would see several players emerge from online and settle into an offline environment extremely well. Zayn is one such player to do so, who qualified for the North American Regional Finals through the online leaderboard, and absolutely showed out when it came to playing offline in what was his first in-person tournament ever. For his very first offline tournament, Tournament, far from home, in the US regional finals, uh -huh. we'll be in the top 8 tomorrow, Posey. He not only made it out of a very tough group which featured players like Sonic Fox and Nitro, he placed 4th overall, directly qualifying himself for the world finals. This is pretty much unheard of and to this day Zayn is still killing it in DBFC and is a great person overall, so keep up the good work my friend. These offline events were cool, however they were not for everybody and only a few could attend. So what about the majority of other players who were still hungry for competition? Well, they would have to stay in the online trenches, at least for now. In June of 2021, we heard from Hiroki who stated, it's currently difficult for us to improve the netcode, but we would like to do our best to provide a place where everyone can have fun and fight as much as possible. So we hope everyone will join us. Referring, of course, to the World Championship format. This shows they were obviously aware of everyone's concerns at the time, while being transparent about the limitations they faced within the game itself. As the regional finals went down in December of 2021, we were all reminded how good offline DBFC can be, and everyone wanted to get back to this as soon as possible. The wait wouldn't be much longer, but perhaps DBFC would never be the same again. December 19th at Jump Festa, we actually got a new character reveal for DBFC to everyone's surprise. The human version of DBFC's original character, Android 21, Labcoat, was shown to a mixed response. On one hand, new content, that's cool and promising for the future of the game. 
On the other, this is a character model that already exists in the story mode, and they obviously just rigged and animated her since it was easier and cheaper than creating new assets for fan favorite characters that have been requested since launch. That's another thing about Dragon Ball, there's like a million characters so not everybody's going to get what they want. But I'm going to be real, I don't know if anybody was actually hyped for her or just happy to see new content. There was another online Dragon Ball Games Battle Hour event in early 2022, which featured a team tournament for fighters where limited characters were available for use per team. However, everyone was able to use the to be released Lab Coat 21 as a preview and man, this is where we all realized they may have made a mistake with this character. Stop. If they're not ready, stop. stop. Wow. Uh -huh. Oh, show him. Yeah. Oh, oh this is damage debuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, Towards the end of the show, Hiroki once again made an appearance to talk about the future of the game. Needless to say, what was said, or rather, what wasn't said, ended up leaving fans feeling extremely disappointed. The World Championship Finals were held offline in Paris at a closed location in July, and this was an incredible weekend of action, with Francis Wawa defeating everyone in one of the most dominant displays of DBFC we'd ever seen. 3-0, 3-0 in top 8? He didn't drop a game! He didn't even drop a game! He did not drop one match! As we moved through 2022, things were finally starting to get back to normal. Offline events were opening back up, with Evo announcing they would be returning to the Mandalay Bay in August of that year. With DBFC again being a game selected for EVO's lineup, it would be the kickoff for yet another world tour, which was extremely exciting. Dragon Ball Offline, this is where it belongs. What wasn't exciting is that Android 21 Labco almost killed the game, and was actually DBFC's first banned character due to her being so broken. Trust me man, she wasn't just bad for the players, the TOs were suffering too. This was a dark time, man. Nah, I don't even want to talk about it. Nah, I'm good. No, no, no. One emergency patch later and we were all enjoying DBFC again, despite a few balance issues. Evo had an incredibly hype top 8 with the Cell Yell run back, <laughs> which was almost ruined. Thanks, Pred. and an electric grand finals featuring Wawa and Nitro, a run back from the World Championship Grand Finals, in what is still the most viewed set on EVO's YouTube channel, sitting just behind EVO Moment 37. That's the power that Dragon Ball Fighters had. After the medal ceremony, to everybody's surprise, Hiroki took to the stage. Then, it finally happened. <laughs> we have decided to implement Robot Neko to Dragon Ball Fighters! Thank you! They had actually done it. Four and a half years after release, the announcement of rollback netcode for DBFC was met with significant enthusiasm and relief within the community. It was seen as a positive step forward for the game and was welcomed by both casual and competitive players alike. This was it, despite the news that development on additional DLC content had now stopped and according to them, DBFC is now fine-tuned to perfection, yeah right, but the game can live on forever and be played by people all over the world, with community tournaments receiving a much needed lifeline at the time. Players still trained hard, with the World Tour running alongside the confirmation that we would one day be getting an improved online experience. One gripe competitors had with this season, however, and rightfully so, was the weight that online tournaments had on the leaderboards. Players could earn up to a massive 880 points from online Tenkaichi events, providing they were of the highest tier of 128 and up entrance. Compare this with the 300 points you could get from winning an offline power event, or even 550 points for winning the only power plus event, EVO, and it still isn't as much. This in a way does take away from the players who are putting in work to travel and earn points, and towards the end of the season it became a real struggle for points between the players who were close to making it into the finals. February 2023 brought some good news to the scene, with EVO announcing their game lineup for that year. Much to the community's excitement, DBFC would get another spot to keep players grinding hard before the finals. Dragon Ball Fighters back again. March 2023 would see the first offline Dragon Ball Games Battle Hour take place in Las Vegas. Bandai put on a great show for attendees, including plenty of giveaways, a viewing party of the latest movie, Dragon Ball Super, Superhero, I hate that name, <laughs> and a live musical performance from the legend himself, Hironobu Kagayama. 
This man is just amazing, honestly. The matches were electric, and it being the first World Tour Finals with a real crowd in over three years made it worth the wait. That was it. Oh, that was it. But don't defer. Oh my God. Wait. Oh, wow. Fenrich would at long last claim the World Tour trophy which had evaded him since season one. And despite winning the LCQ and coming so close to taking the tournament, Francis Wade fell short at second place, but still, that was a run of a lifetime from him. After the matches had all concluded, Hiroki again took to the stage. Surely we would get some info on the rollback update we were hungry for, right? Well, she gave us just that and revealed a beta test that would be taking place in spring, as well as confirming another world tour for the game. They also showed a preview of the next entry to the Budokai Tenkaichi series, which would later on be officially titled Sparking Zero. Communication on the rollback beta had taken way longer than we would have hoped, but at least we had news and would only have to wait a few months for spring, which is a pretty ambiguous term to say the least to come round. We would hear back from the team around May to reveal that at this point, to no one's surprise, the rollback beta for Steam had been delayed. While this was difficult to hear for the already dwindling fanbase, they did include a balance patch to sweeten the deal. The big problem here is that Combo Breaker, which is one of the biggest events in the FGC calendar, was happening on the 26th of May, just four days later. Of course, DBFC was set to have a big tournament there, and this almost divided the community attending, whether the tournament should be played on the old patch, as that's what people are practicing for or whether it should be played on the new patch to perhaps get eyes on the game and show to the world what was possible in the new version. This tournament was not part of the world tour so it was down to the TOs and those attending. Ultimately it was decided that the tournament would be played on the old patch in the interest of fairness but this whole timing situation just shows an increasingly large gap in communication between the game devs and the dedicated tournament scene which at this point they were mostly marketing their game and product towards. Like bro this makes no sense. For the 2023-2024 World Tour, it would be an all-offline affair, with Bandai perhaps not daring to force players to play online, especially as we were coming up to the one-year anniversary of the rollback announcement at EVO 2022. One day before EVO, perhaps to keep everybody's expectations for announcements at the event in check, Bandai would release another statement that we would receive another balance patch towards the end of the month based on player feedback, which is particularly funny since they don't provide feedback forms, so where are they getting this information from? Oh, and we would have to wait a little more for the rollback beta. What a surprise. While waiting even longer for the rollback beta was tough to hear, the patch was enough to keep the community happy for now, and EVO would see 838 entrants travel to Vegas to compete, which is a decent turnout for a now 5-year-old game, with Hikari coming out on top this time. Hikari! Let's go! After the top 6 that year as expected from the statement panel before EVO, there would be no announcement from Hiroki. Later that month, we received the aforementioned balance patch to a mixed response. This was fine, but people were becoming growingly more concerned about the status of the DBFC rollback update. No further information on the beta, and people were beginning to think, did we imagine that? Like, did that actually happen? It was over a year ago and no news, apart from announcements of announcements and being told to stay patient. I don't mind this, and I'd rather a game developer takes their time with something to make sure it's perfect on release, but this was becoming kind of ridiculous. It was becoming more and more evident that maybe something was going on with the development team. There are several theories here, but it's most likely that the original development team had either outsourced the support on the game to a much smaller group or to another team entirely, which would explain the long breaks in between updates as they would be less experienced with the game code. It could also be a number of factors, including more important projects, disagreements between the publisher and developer, or to the difficulties that come with working on a heavily protected IP with so many different owners such as Dragon Ball. I mean, the game was no longer receiving DLC support, and despite the game reaching 10 million sales at this point, Bandai had most likely shifted all of their budget towards Sparking Zero. The balance patch we received in August was perhaps one of the biggest we'd ever seen, radically changing up the tier list and giving a new lease on characters who were previously extremely rare in a tournament setting. Improving lower tier characters instead of destroying the top tiers was the motive here, and in turn would provide for amazing team variety in casual and competitive play. The tour resumed, all offline of course, but players were getting worried with every day that went past with no word from the developers. Waiting for rollback news definitely felt like a Planet Namek 5 minutes. One of the biggest stops on the tour was the Paris Tournament UFA, which always sees a heavily stacked tournament for DBFC go down, and once the top 8 was done, a special video from Hiroki was shown. But... 
ドラゴンボールファイターズのプロデューサーのひろきです。Finally, we had a date to look forward to, and it started in only a few days' time. From November 30th to December 10th, Steam players logged in, and man, this was an amazing time for the community. This beta test had been a long time coming, but the connections were smooth and everyone was loving it. Damn, dude, this game is fun. Oh shit, this is a much different game than I played before, and that game was pretty fun, despite the online. <laughs> It's too good! Sure, it wasn't perfect and it had a few visual and audio bugs, but that's almost to be expected of a beta. Yeah, there's, there's like visual glitches. Look, like right on cue. Hopefully not a sign of things to come. The main thing here though is that playing online actually felt good. You could actually do overseas matches and it felt playable, which is honestly a pretty rare thing in fighting games. Multiple tournaments per day were held with everybody banding together to try and make the most of the short time we had of our rollback fix. Bandai even put out feedback forms during the beta, so it seemed that communication had improved and things were definitely looking up. The community even tried to push for Bandai to just leave the beta up until the final version was ready for release, and honestly, this wouldn't have been a bad idea. Some of the bugs were weird, sure, but the netplay was actually functional. December 10th came around, and as originally planned, back to delay based. Or not for half the player base who just stopped playing entirely at this point, with a huge drop off in numbers. Grand Blue Fantasy Versus actually got a huge update around this time with Rising. Ironically, this was an Arc System game which came out two years after DBFC and would get a fully fleshed re release with an upgrade from delay base to rollback before Dragon Ball did. With the finals coming up, this was kind of rough for those training to compete, as playing from home was once again very difficult. Los Angeles was the location for Battle Hour this time and would see 12 players compete for the trophy. As usual, offline fighters delivers, and we had a great show. Blue car from Florida takes out Yasha. Zane, we take an absolutely dominant game number one here over in Zeb Zane. Tune in. And there you have it, guys. Wade just needs to finish this, and he will be going to the grand finals. Despite Bandai doing Spark and Zero reveals on the main stage during the grand finals of another game, pretty strange marketing choice, but okay, whatever. The finals ended with Hikari taking it, becoming the third person in DBFC history to win an EVO and a World Finals. Hikari, your EVO champ is also the Dragon Ball Fighters World Champion! And Wade coming in second for the second year in a row. After medals, we got an announcement, and let's see what Mama Hiroki had in store for us this time. Nothing. No date, just another announcement of an announcement. One positive here is that she said the team did acknowledge the effort the community put into organizing events during the beta back in December. There were fans holding out for hopes that maybe Bandai was planning an upgrade for DBFC for the PS5 and Xbox series, similar to Grand Blue got with Rising, perhaps a bundle with all the DLC and the rollback upgrade for a discounted price, or something like that. Evo's announcement show went down in early February, and DBFC did not make the cut. This was a huge blow to player base morale, as for the first time since the game's inception, it would not be featured at the biggest fighting game tournament in the world. No news of a date for rollback, and with EVO usually acting as a kickoff for the world tour, but no sign of that happening, it was looking bad for the remaining player base. Suddenly, out of nowhere, on February 28th, Dragon Ball Games tweeted that the PS5 and Xbox Series versions of the game, as well as rollback for all platforms, was coming out as soon as tomorrow? Maybe they didn't know at the time, but this still feels like something they could have announced at Battle Hour. It was only a month prior. I don't know, man. Just feels weird. I mean, from a marketing standpoint, it doesn't appear like they were trying to make any extra money on this. It's a free upgrade with no actual extra content. Guess if you think about it from their perspective, they didn't even really have to make a rollback update, right? They already sold 10 million copies after all, so time to focus on the next Dragon Ball game. But I guess you've got to give them credit for that. They made this because the fans wanted it. They didn't need to do it but maybe recoding the game was harder than they expected and they went into development hell, or I don't know, it could be a number of things really, but anyway, it dropped, players downloaded the game and were met with one of the worst next-gen upgrades of all time. Crashes, DLC not transferring, controllers not working, visual bugs, and whatever this is. 
I've never seen a game breaking bug that doesn't actually break the game like this before, and since it only happens when viewing as a spectator in lobbies, it meant online tournaments couldn't even take place right now, to celebrate the launch of the one thing we were waiting for for so long. Ironically, online tournaments was the community's way of keeping the game alive, and the thing that Hiroki commended the scene for in her video at Battle Hour. Even the character models in the new console versions were changed, seemingly for the worse. Evidence of the update being extremely rushed and lazy came to light as user and artist R Creeps posted a video explaining what happened and why just a few days later. To iterate, this is how the PlayStation 4 version looks. Pretty standard, nothing out of the ordinary, right? And this is how the PlayStation 5 version looks. As you can see, the textures as well as the shading are now broken. You'll also notice that they've subdivided the models. That is pretty evident given the fact that they have rounded out the eyes as well as just the general model itself. You can see that the hair has more polygons um, because it's smoother. And the edges of the model are also smoother when compared to the PS4 version. But you can see the UVs are also messed up. The shading is messed up. Since the rollback release, as of this video, the only thing Bandai has acknowledged and corrected was the problems with the Xbox version. During the time of editing this video, we did get an update from Bandai via the Dragon Ball Games Twitter account, stating they're aware of issues with the current version of the game and they're looking to address these in April. Still an entire month to say something since the time of release? Come on Bandai, do better than that please. It's sad and kind of ironic to see the game which once stood out from the pack of Dragon Ball games published by Bandai as an example of how Arc System's passion and vision could create something so meaningful to so many people, but judging by this release became just another rushed, broken down title. When a game release is this catastrophic, radio silence from the developer is never ever a good thing. On March 8th, Dragon Ball's official Twitter account announced that the creator of Dragon Ball and manga pioneer Akira Toriyama had passed away on March 1st at the age of 68 to acute subdural hematoma. It's hard to put into words the impact he had on the world and will continue to have until the end of time. I've already given my thoughts on what Toriyama's works meant to me personally in another video, but this seems like a good endpoint to the video, as without his vision, this legendary fighting game wouldn't even exist. It's hard to say what the future holds for Dragon Ball Fighters, since right now we're in a weird place with regards to the current state of the game and seemingly dwindling developer support. A fighting game can never die as long as there are people playing and supporting it, and there are still plenty of people interested in super dashing and TODing their opponents. Whatever happens, DBFC will go down in history as a passion project from a dream team of Arc System and Bandai to break the mold of what we ever thought a Dragon Ball game could possibly be. A game which, like the series, became beloved worldwide and united so many people regardless of language barrier, race and background, since we can all speak the language of fighting games and of course, Dragon Ball. I've been Tyrant, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video or stream.